I'd like to thank <clears throat> Perk for the chance to talk to you today and the opportunity to get out of my office uh, and enjoy the weather. I wanted to put this one slide up here. I know a lot of you fly over the Midwest all the time. Uh, it's really an enjoyable place. It doesn't, uh, the, the cornfields are great, but it doesn't all look like that. Bloomington's actually a, a beautiful campus. And uh, if you ever have a chance and you're in the area, um, I welcome you to come visit us. But so today what I want to talk about is, and I used a very general title uh, because I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about, uh, of measuring ions and electrons with nanoscale pipettes. So today I'm going to walk you through sort of the experiments that we do, uh, a couple examples. I'll, I'll explain what nanopipettes are, uh, sort of what's special about them, and then how we incorporate those in scanning ion conductance microscopy. So this is a break from the atomic force microscopy uh, approaches. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the special aspects of SICM. And really one of the, uh, the larger projects that we've worked to, in my group uh, on biochemical uh, mapping in cell uh, monolayers, okay? So uh, nanopipettes are what we're gonna use as our imaging tool. Uh, this is, uh, for the people who do AFM, this is a, uh, a 50 cent probe instead of a, however much your uh, high resonant uh, AFM cantilevers cost you. Um, uh, this SEM is three nanopipettes laying on their side. Here's looking down the business end of one of the pipettes. And then this is a dual barrel pipette, and we use these quite a bit in our experiments, uh, in all the experiments that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, we use pipettes like this where you can electrically address each of these barrels individually. Uh, the key to these is that they're cheap, they're easy to fabricate, and they're small. And essentially, if you use a nano pipette, you have a pore that's on the end of a tip, and then you can move that pore around and you can do things with it. And so that's what makes us a very appealing technique, I think. If you compare this in size uh, to a human hair, uh, if you zoom in on this spot, here's what you're looking at, okay? So that just puts it in perspective because a lot of times if people look at this, they think about a glass capillary they hold in their hand, uh, but it's really not a glass capillary uh, that you hold in your hand. All right, now the way that we're gonna use this is in scanning ion conductance microscopy. We're gonna take the pipette and we'll hear some other talks about this, but looking at the um, Looking at the program, I knew I was first, so I thought I'd take just a second to underscore how this works. We're gonna take a pipette, we're gonna fill it with an electrolyte solution. We're gonna place an electrode in that pipette, and then we're gonna take a sample that's bathed in another electrolyte, in a, another electrolyte solution. It could be the same composition or a different composition. We'll use a second electrode, and we'll apply a potential between these electrodes, and we'll let the ions flow back and forth between uh, this orifice. Now, if we think about this, and we're far away from the surface, I've plotted here um, the probe surface distance versus a DC ion current. And the feedback modes that we use in these experiments uh, are more complicated than this, but this is the gist of really what you need to understand. If you are at distances that are uh, much farther uh, away from the surface than about the radius of the pipette, if you move the tip in space, where space is the Z component, uh, there's really no change in the ion current. But as soon as you get the tip close to the surface, the current falls off precipitously, and you can use this then to set up a feedback loop, which you can use to uh, achieve stable imaging. Uh, so just by picking um, a set point then that's based on a current, you get a scan distance, uh, and you can take topographic images. Here's an example as shown here, and I'll go into some more detail on images like this in a minute. You can do math to understand all this. Uh, uh, it's after lunch, and so I'm gonna try to keep everybody awake here. Uh, the key point here that really happens is that there's a, a fluidic resistance to getting ions out of this tip. Once you get close to the surface, you couple the surface to this fluidic resistance and you get an access resistance. That access resistance then controls um, everything that happens with this tip in space. The other thing that's really nice about this is it doesn't ever touch the surface. So the tip just hovers over the surface and, and senses uh, uh, the surface underneath it, or um, in some cases, the chemistry, depending on what you're doing. Now, for the experiments that I'm gonna talk about today, I wanted to be sure to include some stuff that we've done um, with our PARC SICM, and then I'm gonna uh, uh, talk some more about the home-built uh, instrument that we have. This is a commercial XE bio system. Uh, there's some extra stuff. This is a potentiostat, some electronics that we make, and then there's a big tangle of wires here. Um, 
the home built system is very similar in terms of uh, operation, except uh, we we always start the students on these be, on this instrument because they can understand this instrument very easily. This is one of those that you have to kind of hold your mouth right while you're doing the experiment if you want it to succeed. Uh, and so just to be uh, underscore this point, um, there's the park logo, and uh, every time uh, that I use uh, for the experiments that are using a park, there'll be a little uh, a park logo up in the left hand corner. Okay, so. I consider myself to be uh, an evangelist for SICM, okay? Um, and so I feel like I'm trying to bring SICM to the masses um, and make them uh, appreciate what SICM can do. Uh, it's really versatile. You can use it on all kinds of different samples. Um, it has all kinds of applications that really people are just starting to scratch the surface of, I think, in terms of, of using. And it does enable electrochemistry at the nanoscale. So I think electrochemists for a long time were trying to figure out how um, to really do nanoscale uh, electrochemical measurements in ways other than scanning electrochemical microscopy because it has a lot of uh, the, the, area, the, the barrier to entry on SECM is very high. Um, on SICM, it's conversely very low. Uh, it's very easy to do SECM or SICM. And then uh, we're going to hear today later about how similar techniques that use similar uh, approaches um, can really enable that even more. Okay, so I'm gonna bring you all home on this, hopefully. All right, uh, so I talked about this idea uh, of ions migrating um, between uh, biphasic barrels, or between a, a single barrel pipette, and this is really what Hansman developed when he initially developed the tool. This sort of approach has been uh, carried out uh, for a long time, but. Really, what I'm going to tell you about today are two kind of strange applications of SICM. And we don't know exactly what, uh, at least this first one, there, there are some obvious things it's good for, but um, I, I think it's, it's a pretty powerful approach for other uh, applications too. And so this is a technique that uh, Brian Choi in my lab developed, and it's called, we call it biphasic SICM. We call it biphasic because it uses a dual barrel pipette, like I showed in the SEM uh, initially, we put one solution in the tip of the pipette, and then the outside solution um, is something different. It doesn't even have to have ions in it. So we can do scanning ion conductance microscopy without having ions uh, in the, the bulk solution. If you apply a potential between these two pipettes, ions will move back and forth between these two barrels, uh, and you can use this then to generate a feedback loop. So there's, there's two things that are going on here. There's actually three. So, so with the potential difference, you're driving ions back and forth. With the Z control, you're moving the tip up and down in space, and then ions are diffusing out against a concentration gradient the whole time that you're doing this experiment too. All right? Okay, so, so what can you do if you do this? And I mean, why would you even think about this? Well, it gives you an approach curve that's much different than what you would get in a typical SICM experiment. And the reason why is because if you're far away from the surface, the surface still doesn't do anything. But as you start getting closer, what you do is you enrich the concentration of ions because you change the diffusional profile at the surface. And so the ions sort of pile up in the space between the tip and the surface. That gives you an increase in the current. And then eventually you get to a point where the access resistance takes over again, and now the current falls off. Okay? And so um, if you look at the approach curve for this biphasic SICM compared to a conventional SICM, this is sort of a, a ballpark um, estimation of what the tip uh, diameter difference, uh, what, the, what the surface probe difference, uh, distance difference is. And so you can see if you just did a conventional SICM approach, you have a working distance that's probably like 200 nanometers-ish. But if you use this biphasic approach, you can get much farther from the surface and still keep stable feedback. And I'll try to uh, show you some images uh, to convince you of that. This is a case where we've got a, 10, uh, a factor of 10 difference between the inside and the outside solution. So um, you get a peak current uh, that's actually, the other thing is, is this is also a, it's a signal on, so you're actually looking at an increase in signal, which sometimes is an advantage. I'm gonna skip all of this stuff. But essentially in this regime, we're at steady state where nothing's affecting it. This regime, diffusion is taking over, and then here the access resistance is controlling what's happening. 
Okay, so here this is uh, in different solvents. And so these are PDMS standards uh, in, with one molar KCL in the tip, 0.1 molar KCL outside. Um, we can do it in a solution that's deionized water, and we can even move it to solvents that uh, the ions are miscible in, like ethanol, but it doesn't have to be an aqueous solvent anymore. You can see that there is a clear effect that happens uh, if you look at the height distribution that you get in these experiments. Uh, in the case of the aqueous solutions, the height's about 20 nanometers, uh, but once you put it in ethanol, the PDMS swells, you get a 10% increase in the height. And so you can change then, you can think about changing the morphology uh, of substrates as you're studying, and you can start thinking about accessing different kinds of chemical space that you might not have looked at uh, otherwise. Another interesting thing is lateral resolution and where that leaves you, sort of. And so you can work at these far operating distances, and maybe if you don't want the tip to interact with the surface, uh, you know, this is an important thing to do. And so if we have a set point that's determined here at uh, positive 7%, we can see topography um, like this, and these are uh, collagen fibrils. If we move the set point up, so we're actually closer here, they come into better focus. And then again, um, and then uh, you, can out, you can keep going and work on um, this part of the curve as well if you want to, although it, it gets harder to because the, the current changes faster. Now, an interesting thing to think about is what that actually does in terms of the image resolution. And so these are um, collagen fibrils in deionized water, so there's no ions in the excess solution. And here we are operating um, at these three set points. Um, and you can see, uh, oh sorry, so, so this one is uh, here at the extreme, um, at the positive, and then over here, sort of after we've turned over, you can see that the resolution um, increases greatly. Uh, this is an interesting thing to think about comparing to AFM at this point, because with this setup we can just swap the head and do AFM in the same spot. And you can see um, that in ambient AFM, um, it actually, uh, the, D, the DI water uh, collagen fiber actually looks better. And even when the AFM's in DI water um, and the forces might be mitigated, it still does um, comparably uh, well or, or, or if not better. And we really think this is because sort of, while the tip is smaller uh, for AFM comp compared to an SICM probe, uh, the walls are much uh, sharper. And so once you have these really high aspect ratio features, uh, SICM does a pretty good job um, at this kind of imaging. So this is, that's kind of a, an interesting example, but what we're really interested in doing in my lab is imaging biological specimens. And so this is an example um, of SICM on three red blood cells. And these red blood cells are just sitting on a glass slide. They're not chemically fixed. They're doing um, whatever biology red blood cells do. Uh, and you can imagine if you tried to image these with an AFM probe, it's pretty challenging. Because if you just touch the RBC, it just slides across the surface like a hockey puck on ice. Uh, but if you do this experiment with SICM, because it's non-contact, you can image repeatedly. Uh, we can also do things like retain uh, the physiological uh, function. For instance, if we add certain lipids to this solution, we can make the red cells um, change. They'll, they'll spike up and form these echinocytes. And we can follow that then with um, SICM and these kinds of experiments. And so this is a very robust technique then for measuring biology. We can watch the time course uh, of these kinds of evolution, uh, of an evolution of an experiment like this. So here we've got three red blood cells before we added lipid. And then as we add lipid, you can see all three of the cells initially spike. But then this cell's able to overcome that, and it, it, retains, it uh, reverses its structure to a normal physiology. And eventually the one down here on the bottom does also, but this, this cell's kind of got a problem that it can't overcome. All right. So, this is stable imaging um, over several hours uh, on unfixed uh, biological samples that are uh, alive in the sense that a red blood cell is ever actually alive. Um, so the key point here is that from these kinds of experiments, SICM is non-contact, it's minimally invasive, it's great for biological samples, and it has pretty good resolution compared to other techniques. But what my group has been trying to do for the last uh, 15 years or so is to try to get chemical information out of SICM and not just take pictures. Because a lot of groups had previously done uh, 
a really nice work uh, with very elegant uh, 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 mechanisms where they could image. But what we want to do is try to extract the chemistry. And so that's where I'm going to tell you um, really about this experiment that we've had going for a long time on trying to map um, biochemistry um, uh, in tissue layers. All right, so, so what we're interested in looking at here is measuring conductance across layers of epithelial tissue um, or epithelial tissue mimics. And these are cross sections of kidney tubules. And here you're looking at a, a, a horizontal cross section. Here you're looking um, at the end on view. And you can see there's a layer of cells that line up at this tissue interface. Here's the fluid side and here's the tissue side. And these cells are special, okay? You can tell that they have a different morphology and they, do, they have a different job um, in the body. And you can see it in the, the cross-sectional views also. So this is what's called paracellular um, and transcellular transport across um, this, uh, this space. And that's how um, almost all the epithelia uh, and endothelia in our body work. Um, in terms of getting things uh, across tissue interfaces. Uh, it's really complicated. And if you think about the way that people usually study something like this, they take a layer of cells uh, that they're grown on this, they put it in an, a, se a, a setup like this where there's an electrode on the top, an electrode on the bottom. Um, they hook it up to this and they measure the resistance as a function of time. This is really appealing to me because it's an electrochemistry measurement, okay? And so it's very um, simple. It's, it's not appealing to me because this instrument costs uh, about $200. Um, an SICM costs considerably more, so we better be able to do something that, that drives um, this kind of experiment. If you watch this culture, um, over the course of time, the resistance will jump up and then it levels off. And this is where people would do experiments on it and say that it's behaving like a, a typical biological tissue. Now, when you make a measurement like this, you're measuring hundreds or thousands of cells and cell junctions at one time. And what we really want to try to do is measure one junction at a time and understand what happens where two individual cells or three individual cells meet and how the ions uh, get across that interface. And this really goes back to Hansma's original paper that he published in Science. Um, where he said the SICM can image not only the topography, but also the local ion currents emanating or uh, coming out through pores in a surface. So if you ever need a good idea, just read the old literature because uh, those guys had a lot of time, well, those people, it was mostly guys then, um, but those people had a lot of time to think. They, I don't think they had to write as much paperwork in as many reports as we do. Um, so, so there's a lot of gems uh, in the, the uh, old literature. The other thing that they did, um, even back in the 70s, was this concept of voltage scanning. So they make differential measurements. These differential measurements are key to making this measurement. <clears throat> they apply a potential across epithelial tissue and then measure the potential difference between two electrodes that are situated in space. Um, you can sort of think of it as this, where these are the electric fields that emanate from some kind of a conductor in a material. Uh, and they really did a lot of the math and a lot of the background for it. If you think about this differential scanning, it increases your signal to noise ratio and it cancels out if the electrodes are changing during the course of your experiment. And this really is exactly what we have with SICM. All right, so we're gonna take a layer of MDCK cells. <clears throat> we're, uh, this is an optical image of it. We're gonna grow them on a, a permeable filter and then we're gonna set up conditions where it acts like a, a physiological uh, tissue. And then if you think about our DC approach curve, essentially what we're doing is we're going to make a measurement far away from the surface and a measurement close, and then we're going to look at the difference between those two measurements and understand then uh, what the potential at this area at the surface is. And then because we're doing an imaging experiment while we're uh, uh, carrying this out, we actually can correlate that with topography and structure that we see in the surface as well. All right, now when we started doing this, uh, this was, uh, a, well, it was seven years ago. Um, we would just take the tip and position it over one cell um, and position it over one cell junction, and we would make measurements. And the tip here is about the size of that black dot, and what we measure is a voltage deflection based on what happens with two electrodes that we're applying a potential across the cell layer, all right? And then what we're measuring here is actually, a, it's an apparent conductance, it's not an exact conductance because it's, there's some effect of where the tip is in space that's convoluted into that. And if you do this uh, manual positioning, uh, 
you can sort of, uh, you can take an image like this and figure out where you're at, and then you can go back at a whole bunch of spots. And you can get a distribution. What this distribution for wild type um, MDCK cells says is that over the cell junctions, the conductance is higher than over the cell bodies. And that's great, and the numbers agreed very well with what we see um, from bulk measurements. Uh, but this, it turns out, is a really good way to lose really good graduate students, is to tell them to go into the lab and make a repetitive measurement over and over and over, okay? So uh, if you have really smart graduate students, which I'm lucky to have, uh, you can start thinking about doing some other kinds of things. And so we were really interested in, there are junctions in the cells where this is a junction between two cells, but then there's a lot of special places where three cells meet. And those, uh, those kinds of contacts, which are called tricellular junctions, are rare. They don't contribute very much to the overall conductance that you measure, but they have a whole bunch of um, biology that's very hard to study in any other way. And so you can do some experiments with labeling, and you can see that there are unique proteins that sit at these junctions. Um, but how you get to that uh, in terms of making a transport measurement is hard unless you have a technique like we have. And so if you make single point measurements, you can get somewhere, uh, but you're sort of at the limits of any kind of statistics that you could really um, apply to this to understand anything. So it's time consuming, there's drift, there's statistical analysis is difficult, and so uh, it's very hard to do these measurements. Um, we started trying to think about how ways to do this uh, kind of measurement better, and so we went to a hoppy mode approach where the tip moves up and down, we pause it in space, and apply a potential ramp across the cell monolayer um, when it's in these pause states. And so if you think about what this actually looks like, here's the X piezo, here's the Y, and here's the Z. When the Z, here they're all in the pause state, and then we're gonna apply a transmembrane potential and then we're gonna measure a signal. And for these measurements, we measure potential instead of current because potential is much more sensitive, um, although it's slower than making a current measurement. Now we can do this on membranes and we do everything on membranes because they don't die. Um, we can do the experiments over and over and over. And if you look at uh, equimolar uh, KCL concentrations, you can see that we can clearly measure the conductance. Uh, if we change the bottom chamber so that there's more KCL in the bottom, uh, you gain uh, an extra transport factor where you've got a concentration gradient that really turns these pores on. And now there's a lot of ions coming out of the pores. And we can treat this all quantitatively and really understand it. But really what it gets down to is it's a way to simultaneously map the topography and the conductance changes at the same time. And this is the kind of measurement that you can think about doing with this. In these kinds of studies, we've kind of stopped trying to get really high resolution biological images because we have enough resolution to see the junctions, uh, but we don't really need to know any more than that. And so if we look at a topography image like this, and you can clearly see there's cells here and there are cell junctions in between them, uh, we can then turn that into uh, the conductance measurement. And this really says why it's so hard to make these kinds of measurements by hand. Okay, so the conductance measurements over these spaces are oftentimes just one pixel, okay? And we're really pushing the limits of what this can do. Uh, and you see some interesting things. There are some places where three cells meet um, that you get uh, sort of some anomalies in conductance. Uh, and so that's pretty, uh, that's pretty interesting and it's one of the things that we've started studying more. But what's uh, most interesting about it is it's spatially resolved ion transport. We don't use any dyes or markers. Uh, so we don't use anything um, that might perturb uh, the transport because most transport measurements like this are based on a die. Uh, and that really, if you're trying to look at something smaller than a die, that doesn't work. We can do bicellular and tricellular junctions and compare them. And we can also look at heterogeneity uh, in these kinds of systems. The other really appealing thing to this is this takes months to do and we can do one of these experiments. We can do two or three in a single day. And so we can start getting statistical data and trying to understand things. And it correlates the Z and the, the conductance values um, essentially perfectly. Now, I wanna take just a couple minutes here at the end and tell you what we're starting to do now that I'm pretty excited about. Because I said before that we're, we're pushing the limits of what we can do in terms of image analysis here, all right? So things are starting to look, you know, where if I started asking a student you know, how they quantitate this, it gets a lot harder to pull the quantitative information out of this. And so we started going through sort of some computer vision approaches. Uh, 
to let the computer pick what spaces um, are actually the interesting spaces. And if we do that, we can do things like take cell monolayers where there's an osmolite on one side um, and look at how this osmotic pressure uh, stresses this cell layer. And this is exactly what happens um, when somebody has a concussion. So at the blood-brain barrier, you build up all this pressure in your brain um, and they'll inject a bunch of osmolite to try to counter that. But um, it's a very hard thing to understand and to try to study. It's a very um, sort of empirical uh, way to do medicine. And you know, people don't understand exactly why osmolites work and what they're, what they're doing. So if we look at some of our data, before we put mannitol in, here's what the image looks like. And we actually can go back with the, t with the topography image and correlate that there's a cell here and a cell here and a cell here. But you can see in the conductance map, there isn't much. If you had 50 millimolar mannitol, now these junctions where more than one cell meet uh, really start to light up. And that says that the tricellular contact points are a weak point for this kind of uh, osmotic stress. Uh, we can use these kinds of systems then with this computer vision approach and we can go back and differentiate bicellular from tricellular uh, conductances essentially um, uh, as, as good as we could hope to, I guess. Uh, and if you do that, uh, you can look at the effect of mannitol concentration on bicellular cell body and tricellular junction. And you can see that the cell body actually gets a little bit tighter, uh, but the bicellular junction doesn't show much response to this osmotic pressure, whereas the tricellular junctions show a big change. Right? And so this is the kind of thing that we can think about trying to quantify uh, with this approach in SICM uh, that'd be very hard to get at uh, in any other way. So it quantitatively then captures these differences. And so um, this is what I wanted to try to tell you about today uh, is our experiments in epithelial layers, why we think SICM is special and it has uh, a lot of future. Um, I really want to thank everybody in my research group. Uh, here's Brian, some of you guys know him. Uh, he's great because uh, when somebody asks me if we can do something with an instrument, I just look at Brian and I say, can we do that, Brian? Uh, and he goes, oh no. Uh, uh, so, um, but Brian took uh, some data in the beginning. Um, Kai Shung took some of the data at the end. Uh, and we're lucky we work with uh, Professor Ho at, the, at Wash U's Medical School. And I'd like to thank um, PARC uh, sponsored us with an instrument. Uh, and then we're funded uh, by the National Science Foundation and the NIH through several grants. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. So you're talking about gap junctions, like tubules that go between two cells? Yeah, so there's some really interesting things that you can think about doing. And we actually, we have a paper where we tried to patch one cell. So we patched a cell, put a whole cell patch on it, and then we tried to look at what happened in the junction between them. Uh, that's kind of a next level experiment. That's pretty hard uh, for us. Um, I'm sure that there are biology people that can do it. Um, but. I think there are a lot of things that you can think about measuring like that. So I think you could get at it. You just have to know, I mean, we're, we're sort of pushing the limits on what you can measure here. Um, and if you just have two cells, then the currents leak everywhere around it. And so one of the reasons that this works is because the cell layer is pretty impermeable to ions otherwise. And so anywhere there's a change, it shows up as a, a big change, sort of. Yep. Uh, 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 two barrel? Same way. Yeah, so the, so the glass comes as a theta glass. And what they do is they take a regular piece of glass, they slide a, a long piece of glass in, and then they fuse it. And for a long time, for about six months, Sutter had a bad batch of capillary, of theta glass, and everybody in the United States couldn't get anything to work because there was a crack in the glass somewhere up in the channel. So uh, yeah, but this is where the SICM community is very nice because we could call people and people who had stockpiled glass would share it with you, even though it was so, so critical.
Um, electrochemists are very nice and they love each other. It's not like other, uh, it's not like other fields of science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have one slide that shows an instrument about two hundred dollars. Can you show the data? I think it's the resistance of function of time. Yep. It goes up and comes down. Yeah. Because cells do weird stuff. Um, so what happens is initially the cells make these piles and these clumps and they don't have this nice sort of morphology. And then with time, they find each other and they develop these contacts. And so you have to kind of let biology come to this resting point of where it, it's behaving like a normal system does. So initially, um, when you seed it, there's just cells all over the place. Um, and you have to let those cells kind of get in the right spot and make a confluent layer, if that makes sense. And so that's not satisfying in that you would imagine it'd be harder to get the resistance high, right? But that's, that's what happens, and this is what, um, you know, 20 decades of research on tear measurements, this trans-epithelial trans, uh, electrical resistance technique, uh, this is the standard sort of curve for how they, they progress. I'll take one more now, so, okay. Uh, yeah, obviously we want to look at cells and conditions most closely mimicking physiology. Um, how do you control to be sure that the ions coming from the pipette are not perturbing the cells? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. And we, we do a lot of things with standard cell lines before we try to do anything with a weird cell, sort of. Uh, and so we always sort of compare it like, the data that I showed you with the initial patches, it compares exactly, basically, with what people make in bulk measurements. And so under those conditions, we assume it's not perturbing it. I mean, we could, you could argue that, you know, the local concentration could be changing. The other thing that happens, the electric field gets pretty high in some of those spots, which is a whole other deal to think about, too, so. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.